Mike, how are you? I'm good. Thanks. Good. Glad to have Hi, you here. everybody. I asked a conspiracy music guru if he'd be here to listen to you, and he says, no, I have to listen to that guy every day. Don't make me listen to him again. So he's not going to be here to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, take it away. It's all yours. All right. So let's see. You're seeing me right now, right? But we do you see want to see. I want to share my screen first. Okay. Can I share screen? Share sound. Screen two. There we go. You should see a mountain that looks a lot like an elephant. Got it. All right. Good. So let's get started. So I called this, uh, well, first of all, it's really an honor to be uh, invited here and to, to speak with you all. Fun to be part of this event. Um, and I've titled this talk Biogeology 101. Anyone who's been to university and has taken the 101 courses knows that that's where a lot of the uh, the indoctrination and lies reside. So I thought this was a it was a good title. Uh, biogeology is a term that I've appropriated, and I'll explain it more in a moment. This is what I'll be touching on today: petrogenesis, the origin of stone, rapid petrification petrified titans, soft tissue, and trees. So what is biogeology? <clears throat> like I said, it's a term I've appropriated to denote the intimate connection between biogeology, geology, petrogenesis, and petrification. Uh, the mainstream definition is listed below, but it's little used, and I thought it was much better to explain uh, as a term to really talk about, hold on, just got something in the way here, my notes. So I designed, oh, well, designed, I, I meant it as an umbrella term to describe the myriad of different ways in which the biological material can turn to stone. And uh, we, we know about fossilization, we know about petrification, and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about all of those things. So this is, uh, this is kind of where I was at a long time ago, long before uh, earth shape came into the equation. I realized that a lot of uh, the stuff that I was fed was BS and that basically I was going through the public indoctrination system. And um, as I went into university, I just see my qualifications here. So I have a bachelor's in Italian cultural studies. Then I went to a five-year university for chiropractic. And uh, I did my master's thesis in the effects of spinal manipulation on visceral disease. In other words, uh, organs, problems with organs. And um, so as I said before, um, you know, I, I saw pretty early on that there were a lot of problems with the, the university system. A lot of it was an appeal to authority, statistical manipulation, that money was steering research, uh, and you know there was a lot of um, compartmentalization as well. So, um, and I just want to make sure I'm not on the screen right now because okay, don't you don't want to be on the screen. Got you. Go I don't want to. I don't want to block the images. So, can I get right. you? Great. Okay. So uh, I'll just say up front, I have no background in geology, so I'm not an expert whatsoever <laughs> in geology. So take everything I say today with a grain of salt, because this is all just self-study. Um, but I think that w this is really what we need in, um, in general, is, is cross-disciplinary approaches to research, because there's, like I said, so much compartmentalization that uh, people have a tendency to become ex experts in their little field and not have a clue about what's going on in the in the rest of the the world. So I call it expertitis. <laughs> um, yeah. So some people mock those who are doing their own research, but I, I think that we need to, and that is actually a logical fallacy. It's an appeal to authority, and we don't need to be experts in a field to recognize that an argument is cogent uh, or that the person we're listening to might be using all sorts of different logical fallacies. So cross-disciplinary, that's what we what we want. So I woke up to the, the moon landing hoax years and years and years ago. Um, 
and I knew of NASA's hoaxery, but it never occurred to me that they might have been faking everything since the 60s. And I never even began to question the heliocentric model until I met this guy. Uh, when I met him, I was a space sci-fi junkie, and I, I was uh, believing that we needed to colonize space before we ruined this place. But uh, I was awake to a whole lot of different kinds of deceptions, and he and I started comparing notes, 9-11, fluoride, chemtrails, moon landings. We were just checking them off one by one. And then he brought up the subject of flat earth. And I thought, oh, no, I can never trust a word this guy says again, because if he's willing to believe that, he's willing to believe anything. And uh, he challenged me to, to go prove what I believed. And so I thought it was going to take me about five minutes. I said, what about the pictures? of space and what about the ISS and all of that and um, one by one he just shot down the things that I brought him and so one day I went out with my camera my uh, Samsung telephone nothing fancy no no super zoom lens or anything and I caught a photograph of Ibiza from 90 kilometers away and I was really good at geometry in high school and I started to run the numbers and I looked at the different ways it was calculated and I and I soon learned that um, 200 meters of that of that island should have been obscured so basically the um, let me just bring up a pointer here this peak and this peak these are two highest points of the Ibiza this saddle between them sits at 200 meters and at that distance and my viewing altitude of 134 meters that saddle should have been on the horizon. I shouldn't have been able to see any of it. And it became obvious to me that even without any powerful optics, just my telephone on a clear winter's day, I was able to see all 200 of the missing meters. So I started looking into different, you know, cos <laughs> I started to consider that maybe there was more, uh, more to the old cosmologies and the mythologies that, that I'd given credence to. And, um, and I thought, what a fun exercise. You know, we should, we've got all these things that we're not really allowed to question, because if you question them, you're considered an idiot. Heliocentric, heliocentrism being number one, earth shape, gravity, timelines, all of that stuff. And uh, I, I think it's fun to, to engage in intellectual exercises and, and uh, to do it with intellectual honesty. So, um, funnily enough, Two weeks ago, I went out again. I'd always wanted to catch a picture of Ibiza from the sea level because I'd taken those other shots at 134 meters altitude. And a couple of weeks ago, I was out with Alex and Dave Monell and his family, and I caught this picture with the, the same telephone <laughs> at sea level, three, three meters altitude, and an even further distance, that's uh, 95 kilometers away. And at that distance and that viewing altitude, the top peak of Ibiza should be over 100 meters below the curve. And obviously, you're seeing a fair amount of the, um, the island there be beyond the atmospheric occlusion. So after Alex woke me up to the possibility that the Earth might not be what we thought and what we were taught, I started to come across all kinds of other little rabbit holes that I went down, things like star forts and mud floods and Tartaria, and uh, and then eventually saw the video No Forests on Earth, which really uh, kind of got my imagination going, and a video by Wakey Wakey called Geology Revived, in which he was really kind of dismantling some of the cornerstones of, of geology and things like dating and how long it takes for things to petrify and that sort of thing. So I started to realize that, you know, once, once you realize that maybe heliocentrism is a, is, <laughs> is a total lie, then pretty much anything is up for grabs and, and it's time to start looking at everything with new eyes. So I started doing that with geology. And I came across these two guys, the lower left is Mud Fossil University's Roger Spur. Upper right is a guy named Alan. I don't recall his last name. He had a channel called Flat Earth Nation. And um, he was talking about nephorensics, which is basically the, the Nephilim, the fallen angels that 
everything had been turned to stone and and the stones as we knew them were body parts and that was the same thing that that roger was saying was his his mud fossil theory was that pretty much all of the stones that we see are our biology in one way or another and mainstream geology says something similar i'm going to do a little two-minute crash course in that in a moment but um it was a little far-fetched when he started talking about thousand mile dragons in the sahara um i couldn't figure out how those could exist on a ball that was twenty four thousand nine hundred and one miles in circumference but i like the the mud fossil idea and uh, started just looking at into things a little differently um, and then this whole idea of Titans really fascinated me. Clash of the Titans was one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. And, um, and then I saw this video by Jay Dreamers. And that was really when the penny dropped for me. He started uh, kind of synthesizing the work of Roger Spur, looking at mythology, looking at religion, looking at different texts, and, and also uh, questioning the geological narrative. And... Um, that was when I started to um, ponder this mountain, which is in the town that I live in, which is affectionately known as the elephant. And uh, to many, it looks a lot like an elephant. And I had hiked this mountain for over six years at that point, seven years before I talked with Alex and, and uh, or yeah, six or seven years. I'd been up to the top many times. I'd been up to that cave, which looks like an eye socket a, a, a zillion times. And so I thought, this is just unbelievable. I got on Google Earth. I started looking at it in 3D tilting and checking it out and realized that there isn't just a cave right in the right spot where, where the eye socket should be, but there were also, <laughs> there was also the, what appeared to be the remains of a rib cage. And there were, there were two, two curves in the mountain right where the head would meet the the shoulders of this creature. And there was a big canyon, which I had hiked up multiple times, right between where legs would be. And so right off the bat, I, I realized that there were a good 10 or 12 different anatomical features beyond just this thing looking from an elephant from one angle. And um, so that really, that really <laughs> was a mind blow. And um, I decided, okay, well, I'd been seeing all kinds of pictures like this. This is a real common thing of, um, you know, people are posting these pictures and claiming that they're titans or claiming that they're giants. And and a lot of times it's, you know, shadows and and foliage and different things. And you always see the same angle with this stuff. You, you never get any boots on the ground. So um, I was really hesitant to to get into this and i decided that you know i got to be careful if you open your mind too much your brain might fall out and and uh so these were some of the problems that i was having with with the mud fossil titan research i won't go into each of them because i want to get to a lot of stuff at the end so but pareidoli is is what you see on the right there you see a face in, in something when it's not really there photos from one angle shadows like i said a lot of people are photoshopping the images and a lot of people are just claiming that because it looks like something, it is something. And there's no there's no additional investigation whatsoever. Ever. There's no anatomical analysis, histological analysis, no microscopy, nothing. And um, so I uh, I decided I wasn't going to approach it that way. I was going to I was going to go out and get my anatomy books out and approach it uh, in a more methodical manner. So. Just for a little uh, crash course in, in what they call petrogenesis, this is how it's said to begin. Uh, foliage, wildlife dies, goes under the sea floor, uh, gets compressed into sedimentary layers, eventually becomes metamorphic rock as it gets compressed and it gets pushed downward towards the Earth's core, where that rock will eventually melt and become magma. And then it's spewed out in volcanoes in the form of igneous rock. It's called the cycle of petrogenesis, and this is what it looks like. And so that's how all of our stone is explained. And they have all of these different layers that they talk about, and they've got fancy names for each of them. And they're talking about timelines of, of tens of thousands to hundreds of millions of years, even billions of years. And this whole 
timeline also very conveniently justifies the the um the heliocentric model as well because we're talking about a 16.4 billion year universe and uh and then the earth being 4.6 billion years and so uh, there's a lot of circular reasoning this is one of the things that i learned from from the wakey wakey video and uh that there's you know they tell us how old things are based on the layer they're in but then they tell us how old the layer is based on the things that are in the layer and um this can be easily debunked and it's been debunked by a geologist looking at at the the uh the slurry flows that occurred after mount saint helens erupted where we got all these micro layers of strata in a matter of literally um hours so that would normally be you know tens of thousands or maybe even a million years of of layering of strata and i question whether that makes any sense at all when you see photographs like this how does that make sense that these are just formed by things just laying down and layering and compressing and then eventually kind of melting a little bit and becoming a mix of things this is something known as um banded iron looks a heck of a lot like a tree tree ring so so if you if you think about this nature would have had to do one thing and then another and then go back to the other thing and then back to another and then back to the other thing and it's all in these swirls so how does that work with with the sedimentary layering to me it just doesn't make any sense these are salt formations salt mountains same question incredible complexity there this is where we get our himalayan salt from and you can see again it's this banding and i think it's far more likely that what we're looking at are different ways in which things petrify um and and very likely trees so take it just kind of remember this this image because later on we'll we'll, we'll see something very very similar to this so these the upper left and the lower right are marble caves you can see these these concentric rings so that that doesn't make sense very much uh when it comes to the the layering and then again with the the salt formations these are salt <clears throat> mines and if you look at the grain looks a heck of a lot like tree doesn't it and this is sandstone sandstone dwellings now a lot of people want to say that that's melted building i think it's far more likely that what we're looking at are the remains of the giant trees that was petra a moment ago this is also petra you can see the detail of the grain it doesn't that, that can't be a melted building <laughs> all of these are explained in one convoluted way or another based on the, the the tales of geology but the question is can they prove any of it can you see it occurring no it happened millions of years ago just like with with the basalt columns look at that upper right how does that happen <laughs> so the they tell us that the basalt columns are formed by cooling lava I, I just, I, I completely uh, rebuke the notion. When have we ever seen lava do this? There's still active volcanoes. Stuff's pouring out of them. It cools, it, it hardens. I'd love to have anyone show me an example of, of it forming hexagonal columns so back to the the mountain so i decided to approach it with the scientific method in mind i made observations i thought of interesting questions i formulated a hypothesis what if it really were a gigantic being how would i go about testing that and uh, i developed some testable predictions for example and uh i already mentioned these uh oh no i didn't okay so got ahead of myself there so these are the things i wanted to avoid when i started doing this research 
Apophenia is basically the same as pareidolia, but you're recognizing a pattern that actually doesn't exist. Pareidolia is the same thing, but visual. Cherry picking is when you just pick the things you like and you and you tell people about those and you ignore the things that conflict with your idea. Dunning-Kruger effect is when you think you know something about something, but you really don't. You're just a novice, but you think you're an expert. That's what any geologist in the world would say about, um, about me when it comes to all of this stuff. And when it comes to things like Titans, they would just say there's no evidence. They would dismiss it with a hand wave. They talk about the doctrine of signatures. That's when things look like things. Again, it's just another term for like a flower that grows and looks like a monkey and things look like stuff. Um, yeah, but for the most part, it's just hand wave dismissals, uh, including some very prominent flat earthers. Ironically, you'd think flat earthers would be some of the most open minded people in the world. And some of them are some of the most closed minded people I've ever met. So my approach to all of this was the Google Earth footage. I, I did anatomical histological correlations. Histology is just the study of tissue. So it, I imagine myself as being a microscope. So if you're looking at a mountain that's three miles long and uh, 753 meters, uh, what is that? Almost a kilometer tall, uh, six tenths of a mile tall. What, um, you know, that, you're talking about something so big, you you are essentially a microscope. <laughs> and uh, and then I took micro microscopes to, to the mountain as well. I did CAT scans of the heart stones and endo endoscopy, which we'll get to in a moment, the heart stones. Um, and, and I started looking at a lot of the historical, religious, mythological texts and things that were being said. So I got out my anatomy book. As I said, I started looking at elephant anatomy. Doesn't necessarily have to be an elephant. Bob Nodell, rest in peace, he called it a pachyderm, and I didn't even know the term. I learned it from him, but things like anteaters are pachyderms. So there's a whole family of these creatures that have long snouts. Doesn't have to be an elephant. Someone said it looked like a whale could be a whale. A whale is also a vertebrate. I do believe it's a vertebrate. The eye is positioned correctly. Um, so anyway, I, I started looking at, at things, and and um, we'll, we'll see here in a moment how this correlates to the mountain. But an eye socket has seven bones. They all meet in different places. Those are known as sutures. Then you have fissures in between, which is where the optic nerve goes. There are other little channels that go down. This channel here leads down into the sinuses, which is what you see here, channel going down and the sinuses. And then you have all of these key meeting points. This is a key point here, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second. So looking on Google Earth, I could see right off the bat that, that there was a line here. You can't see it, the whole thing in the picture, but that was right where this line is. There's a cave here, which you're actually looking through here. And that cave is exactly where this would be. This is what's known as the infraorbital foramen. All vertebrates have this in the skull. And if the head were tilted backward, which is what it appears that, that is going on with, with the mountain, um, then, then that would be pointing forward, which is exactly what you see here. So already that was just a crazy number of coincidences, even without having gone up and exploring inside the cave. <clears throat> so started looking at it with 3D software, looking at all the bones, looking at how everything connects, went up there and started getting some photographs, some footage. And um, I was absolutely blown away with what I found on that first visit. So what you're seeing here, this is the temporal fossa. It's one of the chewing muscles. This is the eye socket. So this is not the eye. This is the eye socket. And if you look up close here, there's a line here. That's one of those suture lines I was talking about where the frontal bone meets the maxilla. And this is the this this portion would be missing. So that was one of the craziest things I saw right off the bat was at that exact point where those two bones meet is this structure in the inside the, the cave. I mean, what are the odds of that? Right here, this is an elephant skull. This is what's known as the optic fissure. That's where the optic nerve goes. And in that exact portion in the cave is this, which is just mind blowing. So, um, and, it, and it continued from there. 
I started to theorize that if the eye socket was so well preserved, then perhaps there was an ear. Because looking at it on Google Earth, there's this quarter moon shaped discoloration right in front of where the shoulder would meet the head. And that was this cutout that I was talking about. Um, and so that was when it really started to be kind of twilight zoning. And uh, the reason for that is I, I, I hypothesized that there might be a cave up there. And I went looking for the cave. And when I when I did, I started online first to, to find out. Oops. Hold on. <laughs> well, you can see it here. So, so that was pretty wild. The, I, I went looking for an ear cave and I found out that a team of archaeologists had gone up and investigated an ear that was right here in the middle of this quarter moon formation where it looks like an ear was once attached. These guys went up and they did the most thorough investigation of, of any cave in Europe at the time that they conducted this investigation. They went up with 3D mapping technology. They went up with 3D photography. Um, they were, you know, there there were cave paintings which you saw on the on the walls that that looked like four legged creatures. So I'll just show it again. I wanted to pause it, but I can't figure out where to pause it. That's the 3D mapping of the inside of the cave, which ironically matches where, and that that looks like a cochlea to me, but. Anyway, so it just got weirder and weirder. Uh, about a year later, I went up with some some friends. After the, at this point, I'd made about four or five videos, and um, we discovered that this section here of the mountain, which you can see right there, which I originally... Oh, wait, there's a bunch of chat stuff going on. Make sure everybody's still hearing me. Oh, okay, now that's just the chat. All right, so so this I had theorized right off the bat when I went up there the first time that this this was the remains of the eyeball. <clears throat> it sounds far fetched, but when I was up there with a couple of friends, Andreas Exertis and and Victor Bouguet, shout out to them. One of them recognized that the backside of this structure, which I had climbed up on multiple times, was entirely encased in a ten inch thick layer of crystal and you can see the thick layer here so if you think about an eyeball uh one of my theories in biogeology is that things that are fat will petrify to quartz so the the whole eyeball the outer portion the sclera of the eyeball is fat and then this chunky portion here is where the optic nerve attaches into the back of the eye socket and so this whole structure is one kind of stone, but the entire backside is covered with that with that crystal. So it was just one more of many, many correlations that were very, very specific. Just in the eye socket alone, there's upwards of about 20 anatomical correlations, which is pretty odd if it's if it's something that that is just pareidolia. Like what what's going on? Is the universe just messing with me? Is this a cosmic joke? Well, after I made a video uh talking about that and uh came back no actually uh, uh i made the fourth video on the on the tissues of the mountain on on the histology and i took the microscope to it and and uh and that was when i went in an interview with rodrigo ferrari nunez to show him the mountain again on google earth and when i went to do that i noticed that all of a sudden all of this section here had been blurred out and it wasn't like that before. I'd gone in hundreds of times when I was doing the research, looking at this mountain, and um, all of a sudden, it, it was different. And uh, you could call it a rendering, 
glitch or something odd, but up up in the left there, you can see the footage that I got in, in the initial videos, because I was using Google Earth as if it were a drone. And, and then the after below is what happened after I made the fourth video. What are the odds? It's almost like it's winking at you. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, right? So what am I doing on time? 30 minutes. Okay, I think I'm okay. So uh, I made a fifth video, uh, Unveiling a Titan part, part 5, New Discoveries and Google Earth Censorship. And then in the sixth video, I went and um, addressed a whole bunch of other items, including the microscopy portion of the whole thing. So this is a list of the coincidences that have been compiled to date. That's the first 25 of them. And here's the other 31 of them. <laughs> so that is, a, that is a big number. If anyone likes to play games of chance, you can ask yourself, what are the odds of such a thing? Um, so again, I, um, you know, was having problems with a lot of what I was seeing in the rest of the so-called muscle, mud fossil, titan research community. I put research in quotes there because basically what you're finding is a lot of point and claim and a lot of photographs and not a whole lot of investigation. Um, so one of the things that, that I hit upon, and, and I, I was asking, I, I literally asked God, like, send me some undeniable example of, of a mud fossil, because I, I was still believing that mud fossil theory was uh, what was what was going on with this stuff, even though I, I felt it was highly unlikely that a 753 meter tall mountain would have been buried in mud. And then that mud would stay there long enough, long enough for the thing to petrify. Because in mud fossil theory, the basic idea is that something has to um, be encased in mud in order to, to be preserved. Because the anaerobic bacteria, uh, the, the bacteria and the larvae that would normally eat away at the flesh of, of something before it has a chance to petrify, they're not present when something is surrounded in mud. And so that's kind of the basic idea is that the, the minerals that are in the mud, they're working their way into the tissue while the, the water and the gas is leaching its way out. Um, so, yeah, so I, I asked the universe for, for a, a sign and I found this rock a few days later and I picked it up in the river bottom. It's about four times the size of a human heart. And I started noticing that it had a whole bunch of anatomical features that matched up with the heart. On the right there, you're seeing what's known as the isthmus. This is the, the space between the pulmonary arteries. This indent, or this, uh, these bumps on the side are, I believe, to be the papillary muscles. This would be the aorta and the vena cava. Uh, this is the coronary sulcus. And the outer portion is white, and you can see it's almost red on this side where, where portions of the stone have worn away. And this outer portion would be the pericardium, which is the, the thick fatty sac that protects the heart. So again, I decided to go back to my anatomy books. I started looking at all kinds of different hearts. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes, depending on the species of the creature. But they all have these general things that are in common. They all have an aorta and a vena cava, the two biggest blood vessels in the body. They have these, these different lines, these fatty segments. So I made a video called Mud Fossils, the Heart of the Matter, and I showed with video and, and, and endoscopy, uh, got a camera, got inside the, the, the stone and mapped out these 24 different anatomical features in that one stone. But I figured, going back to the scientific method, that uh, if it was possible that a organ could petrify, which mainstream geology tells us is not possible, then, you know, how would that happen? I didn't know. But I figured if it was a phenomenon that was real, that I should be able to find others. So I went back out into the field to try and find more. And I got to uh, do that. And, and I found a whole bunch of stones that started to match 
this pattern. And I started to recognize that there was a pattern in the stones that I, I was never taught existed. And um, now mainstream geology tells us that those rocks on the right there are what are known as polycalcitic conglomerate cobbles. And I'll break down the word for you. Poly means many. Calcitic means a bunch of different types of calcite. Conglomerate means it's a mix of different kinds of mud that was in some kind of a slurry flow. And cobblestone is just the name of that particular kind of stone like they use on the cobblestone roads on, on in the old cities. So that's what they're telling us. This was a lump of clay that got compressed and became metamorphic rocks. It was on its way to, to melting into magma and becoming igneous rock eventually in that cycle of Petra's genesis. But um, these stones have some very, very specific features, which I'll go into. So I started to, to uh, find them in all different sizes. So it was a repeatable phenomenon. It was scalable. Now, some, some will say that's cherry picking, but it, it, it is in the sense that I'm picking out the ones that are matching the anatomical correlations. So I went out into the field again. I broke a bunch of them open in this video. I show what they look like inside. They're white on the outside, and a lot of, and several of them had chambers and what looked to be blood inside. <laughs> I took some of them and got them cat, <laughs> cat scanned. The pa you can see the patients there in the lower left. Spent 400 euros of my own money to, to have that done. And you can see right there on the left that, oh, it's looping. Um, but you can see the aortas and the vena cava. The endoscopy is here, looking at the inside. Then I thought, okay, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to go out live. And I'm going to film while I find these stones and show that it's not just cherry picking, that I'm going to find way too many given the, the anatomical specificity. The, the, the more items I add to a list of, of what I'm looking for in a stone, the harder it should be to find that kind of a stone. And in less than an hour, I found a whole whole bunch of them that I, that I shared in that video. Then uh, I took a bunch of them over. Alex had a grinder. And... Um, we sliced a bunch of them open and I polished them. I show that in, uh, in that video. And then here you can see some of these reoccurring specificities. Up at the top is where the blood vessels would be. There's this harp shape. There are these things called sulcus lines where the folds of the heart, which I'll show you in a moment, meet. And it gets very, very specific. I had a lot of people asking me questions. How is this possible? Uh, why are the organs found outside of the body? I didn't know. I just knew that in some way the rest of the body had to have been destroyed while the organs were hardened. How is that possible? I don't know. I theorized maybe high heat. And then, then it occurred to me, uh, I came up with what I call boiled egg theory, that the, the, the organs are all housed in this thick, fatty sack. The, the heart has the, th the, fi the, the thickest of them, which is known as the pericardium. And I thought, okay, that's a protective sac. And, and then the organs are floating in the abdominal and the chest cavities, and they're in an, an even thicker sac called the pleura the, the, that, that, that um, protects all of the organs. So I thought, wow, that's kind of like a, a pressure cooker. And I started thinking about eggs and and how quickly they harden because if you think of our organs they're made of a lot of proteins just like like the eggs are and also the the human serum album and albumin that you hear that you see here this is this is 55 percent of blood plasma is basically made of these long chain fatty acids so if you remove all of the water from blood you end up with crystal so this totally fits with the whole uh, idea that that all of these different things are are going to turn to crystal in one way or another in in my theories related to biogeology, and then people are like, well, where are the bones? Because that's what we always find when it comes to uh, fossils, right? The the bones are what we're told are preserved. Well, I didn't know, but but eventually a friend turned me on to the the idea that um, that when you have a crock pot which is what I was just describing a moment ago, the body is essentially a crock pot, then, whoops, 
then um hold on one second turn off that how do i hit play the play button disappeared uh there we go no try the space bar okay. sometimes it might work all right no it just switches the space bar switches to the next slide oh. all right um oh wait maybe there no <laughs> anyway what that was going to show you <laughs> is that if you take these bones and you put them in a crock pot for a number of hours at relatively low heat in a in a six or seven hours they're going to turn to sponge and if you keep going with it they're going to turn to to like a gelatinous substance and so my theory was that uh, the bones were were being dissolved in some way while the organs were hardening. So the two theories went hand in hand. It wasn't so far-fetched. There's this guy in the 1800s, Girolamo Sagato, who had the secret to petrifying any type of flesh in the body. And his, his handiwork can be found in museums to this day. He was known as the petrificator, um, and the um, the secret supposedly died with him. But he was able to petrify organs and anything he he wanted to that was made out of flesh. And um, there was another man named Paolo Gorini who also knew how to do it, and he petrified. Uh, I have some photographs of petrified brains. Now I didn't know about this until some months ago. These are called bog bodies, and these this is what happens when a body falls into a peat bog that's very acidic. And ironically, what happens, and this gets back to the whole, um, um, you know, the, the theory relating to the, the bones dissolving, is that a, a peat bog has a really strange effect on the body. It will dissolve all of the bones, and it will cause the organs to harden, and the skin is preserved. So if the organs were to harden, and then eventually the skin disappears then it's not so far-fetched to think that uh, something else could could take place that would continue the hardening process of the organs and uh, turn them to stone. This is Mother Shipton's cave. This is a place with high mineral content waters where, where things within a matter of months will start to be encased and then eventually turn to solid uh, stone. So it, it's it's a pretty fascinating place. This is Lake Natron. Uh, natron is is an important component in geopolymers, so turning things to stone. This is a lake that has a very high ash and natron component, and uh, when things fall in it, they don't come out. <laughs> this is an artist has has um, taken some of the animals that have fallen in and have died, and he's repositioned them while they were still relatively soft to to um, to create these photographs. But this is just another example of rapid petrification. So that was kind of all the stuff that I was looking into. And then at one point, somebody in, in the comment thread of one of my videos mentioned this guy, Francisco Torrent Guasp. I'd never heard of him. Someone said that the heart is a rope. I said, well, it didn't make any sense to me. And then someone else said the heart is a rope. And so I, I went and I watched this documentary and it was literally uh, life changing for me because the um, the, the stuff that this man discovered decades ago that have still not been disseminated into mainstream consciousness is, is uh, they're absolutely un phenomenal. So um, I've got a little one minute video here that, that just talks about his life. Hopefully the sound isn't too loud. Did you know that almost everything you were taught about the heart is wrong? Most everyone today, even doctors, still believe the heart to be a four-chamber pump that pushes blood through a mind-boggling 60,000 miles of narrowing blood vessels to fuel our 40 trillion cells, then filling again as if by magic on relaxation. Well, that theory was thoroughly debunked by the Spanish cardiologist Francisco Torrent Guasp back in 1972. After dissecting thousands of hearts, Guasp finally discovered the heart's true structure. The heart's far more amazing than we ever knew. It's like a rope, a long tube wrapped into a knot. Instead of being pushed, the blood is pulled through the heart in two spiraling vortexes. See those lines this has there. been proven with CAT scans, functional MRI, and positronic emission. 
Look at the spiraling contraction. It changes everything we know about the heart and circulation. If you'd like to know more, check out these videos. Oh, I figured out how to do it now. I had to get rid of the laser pointer. So here, this was this was the mind blow for me. When he when he rolled this heart back up and he presented it, I heart in two spiraling vortices. I saw these lines here, and I realized that a bunch of the stones that I had gathered had those lines in them in the same places, and I hadn't really noticed it as a reoccurring phenomenon. Also, the bottom of the heart is um, the the where, where let's see where is it? right right here. If you if you see that, it's twisting as it's contracting. Even doctors still believe the heart to be a four chamber pump that pushes so blood through a mind boggling 60,000 miles incredible technology that we've, we've been taught everything wrong about it. I went to chiropractic college. I loved the, the, when we were studying the heart, I knew the anatomy inside and out. And we were never meant, we were never told this. I've, I've met cardiologists who've never even heard of this man, which is absolutely astonishing. He should have gotten the Nobel prize, but, um, yeah, so these spirals here into a knot. They proved Instead it. Of being pushed, the blood is pulled through the heart in two spiraling vortexes. This, ties this in. has been proven with CAT scans, functional MRI, and positronic emission. This ties into the work of, of Victor Schauberger and, and how water vortexes, and it's it's just amazing. I've got a number of videos on this subject on my channel. But here with positronic emission, they're showing from a from above that that it's spiral contraction, but not just not just of the blood flow, but also the, the fibers themselves are are spiling. If you look at here, look at the spiraling contraction. That. It changes everything we know That's about a CAT the heart scan and circulation. If you'd like to know more, check out these videos. Yeah, so that was a that was a huge thing for me because then I noticed that these lines here and the spirals that those were in the stones and the bottom bottom of these stones was almost like a a spiral like a like a propeller blade. So I made a video about it called Helical Hearts, Petrified Organs and Synchronicities and Synchronicity has just followed me through this entire venture. I've I, I, I've done entire videos on the subject of synchronicity and how how it's led to these different uh, discoveries. And and one of the biggest synchronicities of all was that this doctor Francisco Torrent Guasp he lived and worked his entire his entire career in a town called Denia, which is at the foot of Mont Go. So this mountain, the Elephant Mountain, that I've done all this research on. He was he was living in a, and working in a family practice, literally at the foot of Mont Go for uh, decades. Uh, what are the odds of that? <laughs> and then this is the uh, petrified hearts evaluation criteria. So th if you get to know the anatomy of this stuff, uh, and I've got a lot of videos on my channel to show. A lot of people see my videos and then they they just see kind of a, a lump of a rock that kind of reminds them of what they've seen in the videos. And and then they send them to me and they're excited and I I, I don't like to burst people's bubbles, but it, there has to be a lot of specificity before I'm going to jump on board and say, yeah, I think you might have a have a heart there. But people have sent me uh, sent me examples that are far better than the ones I found from all around the world. So these are empirical finds. There's a, 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 a high degree of anatomical histological uh, and anatomical specificity. It's a repeating pattern. They are scalable. I found them from millimeters up to to, to uh, many millimeters. <laughs> it's predictable. I found some that were partially buried and, and predicted what the other side of the stone looked like before, before I pulled it out of the mud. And sure enough, I was correct. There's a logical consistency to, to all of the things that I'm, that I'm talking about. And it's very spe specified complexity. So this is this is where we get into probability and the question of, is this self-evident, but we were just taught not to see it because we were told a bunch of bull about how rocks form and how long it takes. I think ultimately we're talking about a, a term that I coined called paradigm blindness, which I think most experts are, are suffering from um, in their fields because of the compartmentalization and because we've been fed so many lies. So these are examples of some of the other stones that have been sent to me from around the world by subscribers. So how could this have been missed? Well, I just touched on it. Paradigm blindness, 
expertitis, <laughs> right? I, I, itis means inflammation. So it's an inflammation of somebody who thinks they're an expert in things. Um, and the compartmentalization of academia, uh, not just academia, but also corporations and, and the military industrial complex and, and the, uh, and the government. So another thing is geologists are clearly not anatomic anatomists and vice versa. So they're not going to recognize this stuff unless they happen to have also studied. And even if they did study anatomy uh, in, in some detail, they're probably going to dismiss the, the similarities they see because it couldn't put, couldn't be possible. Or is it possible that, that there's been intentional obfuscation and that they don't want us to know these things? Um, and so, you know, the, that gets into the, the big question of why the grand lie. And I think it has to do with things like um, the justification of the heliocentric model, the justification of these in incredibly long timelines, manufacturing scarcity, because I think ultimately if, if titanic trees and titanic beings were a thing and they know it and they've convinced everyone else that they're just fairy tale, then they would have a much better jump on where all of the resources are and how to find them properly because everyone else is chasing their tail and doesn't know that, hey, you're actually looking at a big tree here or you're looking at what may have once been a giant creature. And if that's the case, then you're going to have a much better idea about where to find all those precious gems and metals. Um, so I think uh, it has to do with sequestering resources. Some ask, where are the big trees and where are these large creatures? And I think probably when it comes to the miners that built the ancient realm, they probably took the low-hanging fruit first, which was everything that was on the surface. So just a reminder, petrification is an indisputable fact. We know that there are petrified trees. We've got concretions with creatures that were petrified instantaneously. The petrification can have incredible detail. I go into this a lot in the, in the different, especially the live streams on my channel. I didn't know this until this year, but opal comes from tree, petrified tree. Got this stuff. I suppose this could be man-made, but this looks a heck of a lot like petrified stomach lining to a whale or, or something even bigger. Um, you know, I, oh, um, people have sent me these uh, pictures of petrified acorns. Things can petrify in a very, very short amount of time. So this gets into one of my questions, which is what are geodes really? The human body creates stones. We have kidney stones, gall stones, bladder stones. There are stones called bazaars, which grow in inside of cows and, and, and um, horses that can be the size of a baseball. This is what they look like in a cross section. They grow like rings of a tree, just like the agates that we see. And there's an, there can be an incredibly large number of stones in human body because um, you know, a single gall, gallbladder can have hundreds. If something like a lymph node can petrify, there are over 600 lymph nodes in the human body. And I, I think it's safe to operate under the assumption that everything can petrify because everything has been found to, to be petrified. Um, and uh, even things like jellyfish, which are incredibly soft and should not be able to petrify. They, they've been found with all of their detail, all plant life. Um, there are examples of of fish eating other fish that are petrified and creatures in the process of giving birth. Some might have come across this recently um, well, with the Maui I, fires. I that there's some like videos going around the internet of some interesting bodies, notably like uh, the cat that's like left standing up and then the dog, uh, the dog that's in the street and um, also like the, um, the people laying on the road too, one of them with the special kind of like hairstyle. Um, and I don't really know if we're going to get many um, bodies to be able to, to analyze what's going on, but I was able to get something from ground zero. Because he was in ground zero for how long? Two weeks. And this right here this is, the, this is, the is, a, is a toad that is petrified or mummified in mid-leap. So you can see the angle of it. It's not squatting down. It's very symmetrical. Watch when he shows the bottom. There's incredible detail because from is, the top, it, you see those legs just jumping. You could you could have doubts. So whatever like, oh, it is, is this something happened, he could have made or happened in made a in a cast second. or something. But when he shows it from the bottom, you can see that there's a lot of detail there. 
So this was from Maui Ground Zero. Yep, I sifted it from the ashes where there was melted aluminum 20 feet away. So this frog should have turned to ash. It even has some ashes on the bottom. There you go. Gray. See that? Look at all that detail. See the muscle fibers and stuff. So um, I'm going to just scream through these. I'm not, uh, I'm not even going to talk about them. Why do things petrify? Uh, there's a lot of different theories. Each one of these these slides here is a um, is a presentation in and of itself. Um, so yeah, supernatural possibilities, um, artificial. I mentioned Girolamo Segato already. Things can be petrified very quickly. I showed I've shown videos of of rubies being made in a microwave uh, using plasma in a matter of seconds. So that's a, a two on the hardness scale or a nine on the hardness scale diamond being a 10. So if, if something that that's that hard can be made in seconds from powders, uh, what else is possible? And um, so yeah, uh, there's I, I've shown in my videos examples of petrified wood that have been created in labs in days. People can grow opals, coalification, biochar. Uh, Topher Gardner he makes biochar. Coal can be made. It's all made from trees. So um, everything is coming from the trees, in, in my opinion, uh, and and perhaps titans. A uh, guy sent me uh, a story about his his dog. He he burned it on a pyre after it passed away, and after 36 hours of burning, uh, only the heart remained, <laughs> and it was hardened. So there's all kinds of really weird, bizarre, anomalous examples of petrification. Even though we're told that uh, some such things are not possible, um, there's actual empirical evidence that it is possible. I showed pictures before of petrified brains uh, in, in earlier in this presentation. So now with the remaining four minutes, <laughs> uh, just talking about the, uh, the great trees, um, cave and tunnel systems, lava tubes, the action venture twins, all of these things uh, suggest that the great trees were real and not just fairy tale like we were taught. The, um, the stumps were what initially were interesting to people um you know with the no forests on on earth no forests on flat earth video but it wasn't enough for me to throw my hat in and uh and get involved or what do you say no i can't remember the metaphor but get involved and start producing videos because i hadn't seen anything that was absolutely conclusive this all looks like tree stump and different you know trees that have maybe been busted off but um where's the where's the real evidence this is a this is fun. Dave Weiss sent me this this yeah, last dark. week. It's gonna be a hell of a long walk back to Hill Valley from here. Still the same as the plan. After all, we can't risk sending you back into a populated area or to a spot that's geographically unknown. You don't want to crash into some tree that once existed in the past. You don't want to crash into some tree that once existed in the past. <laughs> Little little taste of uh, truth in plain sight, perhaps. Yeah. So I don't know about the stumps. There's a lot of different theories out there. Roger Spur thinks it's a um, it's a Titan's uh, uh, Achilles tendon. I think I think that's unlikely. Uh, most people that have dug into this think that it's either tree. Um, there's there's another guy who, who's presented this theory, which I think is interesting. Hold on, let me get back there. There's um, mushroom species called Steminitis. There's like 30 different varieties of it, and it grows in this exact fashion. So when it comes to the titanic trees, you're talking about trees that were literally 6, 8, 10 miles wide at the stump, if not larger. And if that's the case, then something like Devil's Tower would have been, um, you know, tiny compared to those trees. So is it possible that this is something that was more like a, a fungus or slime mold growth that was growing on one of the great trees. It's just something that's uh, fun to ponder. Um, regardless of whether you believe in the stumps or not, I'm I'm fully convinced uh, that the great trees were real. And um, and I have a video called "The Great Trees Were Real." Here here's proof. 
uh, that you can check out. But by far and away, the best proof of that is coming from Hangman 1128. These are all of his photographs. And he shows all of the different ways in which these, these manifest. Uh, you can see the tree grain there. The sap of the tree is petrifying to quartz. To me, this is a self-evident proof. You can just see the tree grain. It's manifesting in all of its majesty and complexity and detail. It's, it's scalable, it's fractal, and the tiny trees break down and petrify in an exact identical fashion to what you're seeing here. But these are on a scale that's hard to fathom. Something that would be a, an inch wide in one of these trees would be hundreds of feet across or more. And um, you can see that that's clearly the knot of a tree. And uh, for those who can't see that, I'm sorry, but I think you might need to learn to open your eyes, but that's just my opinion. These are just tiny, tiny little chunks of what might have even been branches in these great trees. Um, and I could do an entire presentation just on, on that subject. Uh, so what constitutes evidence? This, this is one of the ways that they, they try and debunk it, the squared cube law, but it's entirely based on gravity. They tell us, oh, nothing could have been alive in the Silicon era. Um, or, or, you know, that the, the, there might have been a, the, the idea that there was a silicon era is, is silly. I don't think that they were silica to begin with. I think it, that they transmuted. And um, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of videos I've done looking at all the different ways, the elements, the salt mines, the tipuis. I think these were, uh, yeah. One last little thing. This is the, this is, this is incredibly compelling uh, evidence in my opinion. And, and this is from the Action Adventure Twins. They go spelunking down these things. They go down 500 feet, and then they go through some snaking passage, and then they go down another 500 feet. And, um, and you can see that the banding goes all the way down. They want us to believe that's sedimentary layering. But what you find is that there's no water erosion or anything. These are just rough, and it's one band, and then another, and then another. And it's just like, it, it, it's exactly how trees go. and and I theorize that that's because there are big channels inside the trees and that the waters of the deep can come up through them. And uh, I think that might be Thanks, Mike. it for, for the presentation. Yeah. All right. Oh, one last. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Take your muscle and joint aches away with JJ's. Text CBD to 920-382-7720 for $50 off a three-pack of amazing JJ's Natural CBD Rub and or a three-pack of 3,000 milligram CBD veggie capsules, 100 count. Best balm and capsules on the plain earth. Made organic with bee's knees strain hemp. Extracted with dry ice bubble hash method, so never any harmful solvents. Check out our testimonials. Visit JJCBDRub.com.